Hey guys, it's Charles from In The Mess. Today we've got another video about your first day in a new specialty and we've got Andrew and Andre talking us through the best way to hit the ground running in general surgery. Just like the orthopaedics video, this was filmed a while ago in an area with good ventilation, made it COVID proof, but it does get in the background a little bit, so apologies for the hum. Nonetheless, I hope it's a really helpful video for you. It's full of some top advice about some basic decision making and the most common presentations that you're going to get faced with as an FY1 in general surgery. As always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss anything new. Hi, my name's Andre and I'm a general surgery registrar. And I'm Andrew and I'm an FY2 doctor. How did you find uh, uh, being an FY1 in general surgery? Um, I think it was quite a daunting one. Uh, my first placement was a uh, medical placement, um, and I think medical placements in general probably are kind of, you feel a little bit more supported by your registrar because they're there quite frequently. Um, you know, on a gen surge ward, you're, you're on call receiving, the registrar will likely be away in theatre. Um, and at the other end of a, a telephone, um, but kind of not necessarily present uh, at the same time. Um, so that, that was something kind of to get used to. Um, the other thing which I found was quite a big change was um, kind of the ward rounds, um, with a medical ward round possibly taking you till sometime in the early afternoon um, to get around all the patients, uh, and the general surgical ward round being kind of finished and wrapped up by half past eight, so you can get down to the inter. When I was doing if I went into general surgery, I didn't want to be a general surgical registrar. I was actually from doing that job that then made me want to do it. And I found that actually the, uh, it does give you a sense of autonomy, maybe slightly more so than some of the medical specialties. Um, I think for an FY, I think somebody who likes to be busy um, and kind of likes some level of pressure and stress and that, kind of, that helps drive them uh, to, to, to do their job well um, because I think at times you know it can feel a little bit stressed uh, and somebody that has good organization skills to, to manage to kind of keep a hold of all of that information um, without letting it kind of spiral out of control um, I guess it was a case of just trying to be as prepared as possible really um, the other things I, I guess is trying to kind of keep our kind of jobs list. Um, I guess the two options are that you can either kind of flash around the entire ward and just you know accept that you're not going to be able to keep the jobs list, but that you're going to go back through all the folders and take your jobs book and add them all in at the end of a ward round. Um, or the, the kind of alternative is trying to kind of keep your own list as you go with all the jobs that you're going to need to do. I mean, I think that is one of the challenges of uh, the way that we end up working, but I think it's really important that when you are having doing the board round, you are working as a team, and uh, every member is actually able to speak up, and you know, it is, it shouldn't just be one person going around leading and sort of dictating what needs to be done. Uh, means that things don't get missed, and uh, you know, aids and patients care. Uh, to kind of getting them home and getting them discharged. Yeah. Um, and as a junior, you know, you'll quite often be asked to organise, you know, a CT scan for this patient, and you don't necessarily know at the time like why, why are they wanting the CT. What specifically is the consultant or the, the registrar wanting to answer? But and actually, it's really useful on the ward round, um, maybe not necessarily in front of the patient, but just as you're moving rooms to kind of just figure out. Why, why are we wanting that CT? Um, just so that you kind of have a bit of an explanation, so that when you're doing the request, you've, you're kind of you're asking the right question to the radiologist, um, so you're more likely to get the scan accepted. Yes, I mean I think it's important when um, you're requesting scans that um, you know if you're not able to provide the information that's required, then actually um, you know you do you do speak to them, and it may be that it's uh, something that either we haven't managed to explain very well or you know, it's, it's, they're, they're wanting to talk through the reasonings because actually you might have requested a CT scan but actually they might want to suggest a different mode of um, uh, investigation um, and actually um, that may, and that's something that often has to occur between senior members of the team. Uh, the, the discharge letters from general surgery, you know, you will have a lot of patients, you've got a lot of jobs that you're trying to do, so they do have to be quite, quite quick and succinct. 
and it's briefly explained the, the symptoms they had, um, say what procedure or say what investigations they had done, say what procedure they had done and on what day uh, and probably by what consultant as well, say if there were any complications either during or afterwards um, and then you know make sure you've got a follow-up plan. Personally if I feel that there's any chance of there being any large bowel obstruction or any bowel obstruction I tend to um, form a PR um, partly to check whether or not um, there's uh, uh, you know, impact of feces and things but also to check that there's no lower rectal lesions which other could be potentially missed on um, CT imaging. I think that most, the way that I see it is that if a patient's been accepted to hospital there's a sort of a certain group of things that I want to do. Obviously you're going to want a good history examination and then to come up with some good differentials. If they don't have a clear source, then obviously a urine dip would then pick up keto, urine ketones. And we want to make sure that obviously they're sure that it is a surgical abdomen and not um, a medical uh, cause which is presenting. So either a basal pneumonia, DKA. When you're taking your bloods off, just having a think ahead of what your differentials are and making sure that you try and get as many of the blood tests off in the first go as you can, considering whether they might need a coag screen. Um, if you think that they're going to need a major operation, then you know, do you need to be grip and saving or even cross-matching them? Um, and you know, if they look critically unwell, then do you want to get your VBG? If they're septic or they've got a, a fever, then you know, do you need to be taking blood cultures off as well? And doing all that at the start will give you much more information to work with. So remembering sort of your liver function tests and also um, making sure that you've got an amylase as well, um, picking up patients who potentially have pancreatitis. Some hospitals also use a lipase, so um, you'll need to see what you're using in the local area. So yeah. the three common conditions that we need to know about or that are key to reading up on before starting. In terms of in terms of acute abdomen, like that term, I think gets thrown around quite a lot. Um, I think it can be quite hard at times to necessarily kind of identify what exactly is meant by acute abdomen. So I think when you're dealing with the acute abdomen, it's you do have to go in. Uh, you know, it, it is a, a blanket term that goes over a lot of different acute surgical presentations, um, being from sort of bowel obstruction and infection to um, uh, sort of more of the biliary stuff. I guess, you know, a peritonitic abdomen as well. Like someone who is acutely tender to even the lightest of touch, you know, that's that's got to be something that's got to be raised to a senior pretty pretty soon on as well. Yeah, I think it is something that does need to be raised early on. If you, if you suspect peritonism, then obviously, you know, your registrar is going to want to know that. They're going to want to escalate that. And so when I examine someone, I tend to say they're either tender or they've, or when I then, um, when it's so I either have a feel or I then do percussion tenderness. I don't do rebound tenderness as I find that it, it, it can be positive in a lot of different people. Um, I tend to percuss their abdomen and if they're tender on percussion, then I tend to say that they're sort of peritonitic. There's other bits about the history as well, so when they're moving around and things and if they're sore, then obviously, um, the classic one is sort of driving in in the car, or is it sort of going over the pumps and things? <laughs> uh, so I think, I think for an issue with the patients that present with right upper quadrant pain, obviously you're going to want to do your um, history and examination. Um, you're going to want to make sure that if they're a female patient, they've had a pregnancy test. If they've had, um, uh, you know, make sure they've had a urine dip done as, uh, as part of that. With blood tests, obviously you're going to then need to know what their liver function tests are doing and what their inflammatory markers are. And then in most places, um, we start off with ordering an, an ultrasound scan of the right upper quadrant. Um, when covering the surgical high dependency overnight, uh, um, a lot of it is for fluid reviews overnight of patients that have had large uh, intra-abdominal surgeries. I guess when it comes to prescribing intravenous fluids, it's really important that, um, especially with patients who either have um, an ileus um, or are in that post-op period that they're getting and they're on intravenous fluids that are having regular um, uh, use and ease done to check that um, their electrolytes are all um, appropriate because around the times of surgery people's electrolytes can um, vary quite a lot um, and especially if they've got ongoing 
uh, gastrointestinal losses. Um, they can require additional sodium, chloride and potassium. Uh, you get quite a lot of patients being put on to TPN and kind of other forms of nutrition and it's kind of worth remembering that they're going to need more frequent blood tests to, to kind of check the potassium and the phosphate and, and magnesium levels. Um, and then again, when you're trying to work out your fluid balance for these patients, also kind of trying to work the TPN and how much fluid they're getting from that in with it as well, it's, it's kind of another consideration to... Yeah, I mean, I think it is something that is quite, can be quite, seem quite daunting and quite complicated. Um, I think it's something, that obviously, is something you're going to have to pick up as you um, are an FY1 and you know, these are the times where you're going to need to ask and run things past people. Um, I guess it's important if you're going to be doing that that you're really accurate with um, the numbers that you've taken and um, you know, really reviewing the charts to work out what their input and their output was and knowing you know, if they are on additional sort of types of fluids such as TPN um, or NG feeds that um, the, that they're calculated into your uh, calculations of what they might need. Quite often when someone on print is acutely unwell and you think that they're septic, you know, the, it's very much a kind of throw a wide net initially to kind of cover everything else. Once you've narrowed down with some investigations as to where exactly their infection might be, you can kind of make it more selective. Yeah, no, uh, that's um, right. Um, and you're able to then um, select and rationalise the antibiotics. And micro is always your friend. Yes, <laughs> microbiology. Yeah. If in doubt, yeah, for right, 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 right. micro. Yeah, I mean, we'll always try and cover, cover, follow the guidelines. But yes, there are going to be patients that um, you know you are going to need their advice on.